co-author drop off a book of a uh, book one day before the final draft was due to the publisher? And so changes and fixes that he was supposed to have been done, well, you can figure out the rest. Okay. As you know, Friday is going to be a wonderful day, right? Our first non-diagnostic exam. And so to try to relieve some of the pressure, I am splitting it up so that you may do the first problem before Friday. Once you open it, once you start looking at the problem, it's closed book, no calculator, but you have as much time as you want. You should be able to do it within 22 minutes. There is homework from what we're going to do today on integration theory. I will not collect that homework until April 1st. That is not a joke. That is when it is due. I urge you to do it before spring break so that you don't have you know, to lug that heavy book home with you. But you know, if not, you can just bring the homework problems with you, and hopefully it shouldn't be too bad. Uh, there is a Sable lunch today at noon at Mission. We're going to be doing March Madness and entering the pool and hopefully beating all the other colleges and universities. Uh, there will be a review session Thursday night. I may or may not tell my kids what some of the exam problems are. If I do, it might just be Kayla, because Cameron is now old enough to remember. Uh, last time I taught this class, he was too young, and he could only give partial information, even though the students were heavily bribing him. Uh, any general questions on the exam? You know, the first question is up to and including the chain rule. Lagrange multipliers and integration theory will not be needed for the exam. If you want to use them for some of the problems, that's fine. I took econ classes where they told us calculus is not needed, but I always took that as a challenge to then find a way to use calculus to solve some of these econ problems. But you will not need to know Lagrange multipliers or integration theory to solve the problems. Yes? Whatever is right before Lagrange multiplies, that's the cutoff. Okay. Any other general questions? I'll leave some time at the end of class today for specific content questions. Yes? Everything from the beginning of the semester. Any other general questions? Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to generalize the results from last time when we did integration on the line to integration over the plane. Now if you think about it, one-dimensional integration is boring. What kind of shapes can I integrate over in one dimension? So you live on the real line. What kind of shapes do you have that you can integrate over? Yes? Square does not live in one dimension, right? A square is a two-dimensional object, a line. And they also said at, in 10 a.m., they also said a point. Well, okay, if I integrate f of x from a to a, that's not a bad integral. Right? That's just 0. And then I have integrals over lines. That's it. There's really not that many shapes in one dimension. In two dimensions, there's a lot of shapes. The difficult part of two-dimensional integration is that you have so many different types of shapes. And you have to figure out how do you integrate over these more general regions. So the first question is, what is the generalization of a line to two dimensions? A line becomes becomes what? Well, wh what's the nicest shape that you could think of for two dimensions? In one dimension, we had a straight line. In two dimensions, what would you have? So it's going to be rectangles. So A, B, cross C, D, this is a rectangle. It means the set of all pairs x and y such that x is in A, B, and y is in C, D. So it's the generalization of a straight line. So in one dimension, we had the interval A, B. So now if you want to look at it, here's A, here's B, here's C, here's D. And I get the rectangle like this. And this is similar notation to things we've seen before. We talked about in the past, you know, R2 is pairs of real numbers. So this is pairs, you know, x, y. R3 was triples x, y, z. And so now what we're doing is we're just looking at the, an interval cross an interval. So the first component is in AB, the second component is in CD. And the question is, how do we integrate like this? Well, we basically do what we did in one dimension. We do Riemann sums. 
And what we do is we just chop this up into lots of different pieces. And I'm not going to go through the details. The calculation is almost identical to what we did in one dimension. I slice up the x-axis. I slice up the y-axis. I get lots of small sub-rectangles. On each sub-rectangle, I see where's my function largest, where's my function smallest. I get my upper sum. I get my lower sum. I saw the difference between the upper and the lower sum tends to 0. I then show that the upper and the lower sums converge to a value. I then show that that value is the area under the curve. That's basically by definition. But here's where things get harder. In one dimension, the fundamental theorem of calculus then said we have f of b minus f of a. Can we have something similar here? So here, unfortunately, we now have something that's depending over a region. There's two dimensions. And so the problem is I can't just evaluate some antiderivative at b minus antiderivative at a. I have a more complicated system. And so what we're going to get is the following. So I'm going to let this be the notation for the area under the curve over the rectangle. So this will be f of x, y, dA. So dA is going to be my little area element. f of x, y is going to be my function. This is going to be the region I'm integrating. Why do I have two integral signs? I have two integral signs because two dimensions. right? You want notation to help you. By looking at this, I can see, OK, I'm doing a double integral. And so by going through the Riemann sum calculation, we don't have anything as nice as big F of b minus big F of a. What we do get is the following. This is the integral x goes from a to b, integral y goes from c to d, f of x, y, dy, dx. And this is the same as the integral y goes from c to d, integral x goes from a to b, f of x, y, dx, dy. And so here, when I'm doing all of these calculations, I have some assumptions. So here, what are my assumptions? Rectangle is finite. So in Calc 2, for the most part, you probably integrated over finite regions. You have to be careful if your region is infinite. And the second is I want my function to be nice. f is nice, maybe continuous. Now, continuous is more than enough for something like this. And so what this is telling me is the following. If I chop things up first with respect to y and then with respect to x, or first with respect to x and then with respect to y, it doesn't matter. So everybody's going to get a score on your exam on Friday. I guarantee that. Okay? Here are two ways to see how many points the entire class scores. I can add the score of each row and then sum all the rows. Or I can add the score of each column and then sum all the columns. Should the total number of points earned in the class depend on the order in which I do things? No. So this is basically the content of what's called Fubini's theorem, that you can switch the order of integrations. I have posted a video from when Cam was about two years old uh, giving, a well, giving a way to switch orders. So it's a little lesson from him on how to switch orders. This is one of the most important techniques in Calc 3. If you have a hard integral, try switching the order. And maybe it'll be easier. It does not always work. So later today, I will give you an example where you cannot switch orders, where you will get a different order. And that's equivalent to saying, if I add by rows and then by columns, that's different than adding by columns and then by rows. Okay, it seems absurd that something like that could happen. The danger is that I'm no longer going to have a finite region. My region is going to be infinite. And whenever you have infinities in mathematics, you have to be careful. There are so many different shapes. We want to learn how to integrate over general regions. That's the content of section 13.2, is which regions are going to be nice to integrate over. It turns out. If we can allow f to be slightly non-continuous, we can convert most regions to rectangles. And then we have ways of doing these calculations. But for the most part, we just do the Riemann sums over rectangles. We understand rectangles. And I believe I did this comment earlier in the semester. So let's go back to polar coordinates. So x is r cosine theta, y is r sine theta. 
and here's a circle of radius 1. Okay, and here's my x-axis, here's my y-axis, and I have a circle of radius 1. What does this look like in our theta space? What shape does the circle of radius 1, you know, the Philbin circle, look like? So what's this geometric object? A rectangle. So the radius goes from 0 to 1, the angle goes from 0 to 2 pi. This gives you an idea of why we like polar coordinates. If I'm integrating over a circle, a circle is not a rectangle. This is a deep fact. Okay? By converting to polar coordinates, I can convert the circle to a rectangle, and now I have easy ways to integrate over rectangles. It turns out it's much better to work with a harder function over a nicer region than a nicer region with a, with a um, harder function. What do you think a sphere looks like in spherical coordinates? So in polar coordinates, a circle became a rectangle. What do you think a sphere is going to look like? Can't quite say cube. I'm sorry? Box, right? It mean, it's probably not going to be a cube. Cube means all the sides are the same. But it's probably going to look like some kind of box. This is why we like spherical coordinates. It converts, again, a very difficult region with nasty constraints into a very simple region, into a box. OK. So essentially, this is how you do all nice multi-dimensional integrals. You do calc 2, and then you do calc 2 again. Okay? That's the entire subject. So let's do an example. I'm going to do this example in excruciating detail. Okay? Once in your life, you should see an example done this slowly. I do not expect you to take this many steps when you're doing it on the homework. If it's been a while since you've done integration, I know some of you can measure how long it's been since you've taken calculus in years. By all means, do more steps. The more steps you do, the less likely you are to make a mistake or forget something. I want you to do the steps once to just really highlight what's going on. So I'm going to assume you remember all the basic facts from integration. The integral of a sum is the sum of the integrals. The integral of c times f is c times the integral of f. U substitution, yes. Partial fractions, no. Okay? I will not do partial fractions in this course. Okay? I'll not do, for the most part, I, think, I don't think we're going to do any trigonometric substitutions in this course. Uh, maybe once or twice for examples. For the most part, it'll be U substitutions, stuff like that. I. So for example, let's say I have x goes from uh, 0 to 1. There's a typo on the board. y goes from 0 to 2 of 3 xy plus 2x squared Oops. dy dx. And so if you notice, I am being extremely careful. I'm putting in far more symbols than I need. I'm putting in the square brackets here to remind myself I'm doing this integral first. You do the one that occurs first, first, and the one that occurs second, second. Sadly, this is opposite of something else we've seen. When we have f of x, y, I believe this is d by dy of df dx. I always forget which way it is. You will not forget because you have to take an exam. You will put this in short-term memory. I always forget. Why is it not horrible that I forget which way it goes? It's not because I have a secure job. Why is it not so bad that I forget which way is which? What theorems do we have about these derivatives? So the theorem we have is that f of x, f x y is f y x as long as all the second derivatives exist and are continuous. So in most cases, they're equal. So it doesn't really matter which way I do it. I can take the derivatives in either order. Over here, when I write this down, I have my bounds. And I have to be very careful that I do the integration in the proper order. The book and most people in the world do not put the variables down there on the bounds of integration. I do this just to have another reminder for myself of where I'm integrating. x goes from 0 to 1. y goes from 0 to 2. This is just to remind me of which variable is changing. Okay? You don't need to put the stuff there. This is just to try to make it a little bit easier to follow and remember. All right, so now let's do this integral very slowly. What's the first rule I should use to evaluate this integral? to help me analyze the y-integral. 
What's the first rule? I have the integral of 3xy plus 2x squared. What rule would you use? Some rule. So this is going to be the integral y goes from 0 to 2 of 3xy dy plus the integral uh, y equals 0 to 2 of 2x squared dy dx. What you have to remember now is x is constant. I'm letting y change, but x is fixed. If I put in x equals 5, this would just be 15y, and this would just be 50. x is just some number. I'm integrating with respect to y. So x is a constant. So what rule can I use next? So what rule would, would I use next? I use the constant rule. And so this is now the integral x goes from 0 to 1. I can pull out the 3x and have the integral y goes from 0 to 2 of y dy plus 2x squared integral y goes from 0 to 2 of 1 dy dx. And again, when you're doing homework and whatnot, by all means, feel free to just jump directly to the integral. I just want to go through the steps just once because I know it's been a while since some of you have integrated. All right, so now this is just x goes from 0 to 1. I get 3x. And now the integral of y is y squared over 2 evaluated 0 and 2 plus 2x squared y evaluated 0 and 2. And that's going to just be the integral x goes from 0 to 1. All right, I'll have 3x. Uh, 2 squared over 2 is 2. So I'll get 2 minus 0 plus 2x squared 2 minus 0. Oops, and this should be a dx here. OK, so now I'm just integrating x goes from 0 to 1. I'll have 6x plus 4x squared dx. So I get 6x over 2, 6x squared over 2 at 0 and 1 plus 4x cubed over 3 at 0 and 1. And so now I plug in the value of 1 and I plug in the value of 0 and I subtract and I will get 3 plus 4 thirds. Okay, so this is how we would do multi-dimensional integrals over rectangles. Basically just calc 2 twice. Okay, and then you can use all your rules of integration from before because you fixed x and y is varying. And so you can just pull x out. Okay, any questions about this problem? So this is the prototypical multi-dimensional integral to do. What I want to do now is I want to do a more interesting integral. And so again, I'm going to still keep myself to be integrating over rectangles. But I'm going to take a more enjoyable function. So I'm going to take the function x times e to the xy. And so now I want to integrate over the rectangle 0, 1 cross 0, 1 the function x e to the xy dA. So I'm not telling you which way I want to integrate first. Do I want to integrate first with respect to x? Do I want to integrate first with respect to y? If you are only going to be awake for one minute today, I recommend this minute right now. This is the most important part of today's lecture. Which do you think is better, x or y, to integrate over? Or do you think that there's no difference? Or if you don't know which is better, do you think there's a difference? So who thinks there might be a difference between x and y? Okay, so why might there, why might there be a difference? Good, there's an asymmetry. There's an asymmetry. Asymmetry with x and y. One order might be superior. <coughs> OK. Well, let's try to think. If I integrate with respect to x first, I have x e to the xy. How do I have to integrate that? What technique would I use to integrate x e to the xy? No, you can't pull out e to the y, unfortunately. If it was e to the x plus y, 
then that would be e to the x times e to the y. But how would I integrate x e to the x y? Or more simply, how would I integrate x e to the x? Integration by pots. So if you get bored later today, hopefully not during this class, try integrating this by pots with respect to x. I don't want to integrate this by pots. If I integrate this with respect to y, if I gave you e to the 5x, I would love to have e to the 5x times 5 dx. That would be beautiful to integrate. If I had e to the 7x, I would love to have e to the 7x 7 dx. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just move the x over. And then the integration is going to be a lot easier. So this is the same. So this is telling me I want to do the y integral first. x goes from 0 to 1. y goes from 0 to 1. e to the xy, x dy, dx. And this is now perfectly set up for the y integral. The coefficient in front of the y in my exponent is x. I want to get an x dy. So I'll go through the u substitution. I know it's been a while since some people have seen it. Let's let u be x, y. So as y goes from 0 to 1, what does u go from? So if y goes from 0 to 1, what's my range of u? 0 to x. And du is going to just be x dy, because remember, x is fixed. x is a constant. And so I get that the integral from, zero, from y equals 0 to 1 of e to the xy x dy is the integral u goes from 0 to x e to the u du. And again, you don't have to go through all the steps. If you want to integrate this directly, please do so. I just want to go through it you know, once or twice to really highlight. And I claim, well, the antiderivative of e to the u is just e to the u. So I get um, e to the u at 0 and x, which is just e to the x. So what mistake did I make? e to the 0 is not 0. It's e to the x minus e to the 0. This is one of the more common mistakes is you know, people will say e to the 0 is 1. I'm sorry, e to the 0 is 0. The other mistake that people often make in problems like this is that after they evaluate this function at the bounds, they'll have u's or y's. You cannot have u's or y's. No u's or y's here. And it's because we integrated out. That was the whole point of doing the u integral or the y integral. We integrate out the variable and we have a number. When we integrate out the y, there's no longer any y dependence. Can there be x dependence? Yeah. We still have x as a variable. x is still ranging. But once we've done this integral, there is no longer any y dependence. Or if I've changed variables, there's no longer any x dependence. OK. So we've now done the first half of the problem. We've integrated with respect to y. Now we have to take what we get and integrate the remainder with respect to x. And so we get now the integral x goes from 0 to 1. And now we're going to have a function, which is e to the x minus 1 dx. So this is going to be e to the x at 0, 1 minus x at 0, 1. So we get e to the 1 minus e to the 0 minus 1, which is also known as e minus 2. OK. As you are probably aware of, I do not care that this value is e minus 2. I don't really care about this problem. I care about this problem only in that it illustrates some great concepts. It illustrates that it could be worthwhile to think about which way do you want to integrate. If you spend a few moments thinking, you can avoid integration by parts. If you randomly choose, you have a 50% chance of hitting the wrong order. The other question is, is this a reasonable answer for the problem? You know, are you surprised that the answer is e minus 2? Well, one way to get a sense of what the answer is is I could chop up x and y into 40 different pieces, have you know, 1,600 little boxes. On each box, I could you know, take some value of the function. I could add up those 1,600 numbers and see how close that is to e minus 2. I'm not going to do that. You're not going to do that. 
Is there a quick test we can do, a quick sense of what the value of this integral should be? Again, this is one of the things I want you to get out of Math 105, is how to look at an expression and ask, is this a reasonable number? What can you tell me about this integral before you even do it? How large could it be? How small could it be? So any thoughts as to how large this integral could be? I'm sorry? I think somebody said it. So how large could this integral be? One. One. Why? Okay. Yeah, so it could be actually a little bit larger than one. What's the largest it could be? E. So um, how big and small? So one. The integrand is less than or equal to e. So integral is less than or equal to the integral from 0 to 1, integral from 0 to 1 of e dA. And what's the area of the rectangle? So I have the unit square, so the area of the unit square is 1. So this is at most e, or if you want, e times 1. So we know the answer can't be more than e. Right. What about a lower bound? Can anybody give me a lower bound for the integral or for the integrand? It's greater than or equal to 0. So the integral is greater than or equal to the integral from 0 to 1, integral of 0 to 1 of 0 dA. I will not give you such a nice integral on an exam, but what would that integral be? So I'm integrating 0 over a region, 0. So we know the answer. So we know 0 is less than or equal to the integral over 0, 1 plus 0, 1 of x e to the x, y, dA is less than or equal to e. With more work, we could get better, we could get better estimates than this. But these are some quick answers. It should be something between 0 and e. Okay. Our answer is somewhere between 0 and e. OK, so things at least look reasonable. They look consistent. OK, so this is how you do two-dimensional integrals. Basically, just do one-dimensional integrals twice. If I gave you a three-dimensional integral over a box, you would just do three integrals. It gets more tricky when you try to integrate over you know, complicated regions. And that's going to be section 13.2. All right, so what I want to do now is I want to give you an example of the dangers that can happen that you may not always be able to interchange the order of integration. Rather than doing integration, I'm going to do sums. You can always take the sums I'm giving and you'll spread them out, smear them out a little bit, and convert them to integrals. But it's just a little bit easier for me to write down the sum. So cannot always switch orders. And here is a great example. In the interest of time, because I know you want to ask some questions about the upcoming exam, I will only draw finitely many dots. But you should imagine these dots go all the way off to infinity. One more set. And these dots go this way, these go this way. All right. I'm going to draw all pairs of integers with non-negative coordinates. So this is going to be 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, and so on. This will be 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1. This will be 0, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, uh, 3, 2, and so on. And I'm going to define a sequence. So I'm going to give you values of my sequence. And it's going to be as follows. It's going to be 0 here, plus 1 here. I'm sorry. Yeah, plus 1. No. Plus 1 here, minus 1 here, and then 0 for the rest of eternity going up. So the first column goes plus 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. The second column is 0, plus 1, minus 1, 0, 0, and then 0 for all eternity. The next column is 0, 0, 
plus one, minus one, and then zero for all eternity. Okay? Let's look at what's going on. So these are the values of a, m, n. So the m is my x coordinate. So if I fix m, if m equals two, this basically fixes a column. So I'm going up a column. Fixes a column. This is my y coordinate. What do you think this fixes? Fixes a, oh, fixes a row. So if n equals one, I'm in this row. So if I look at the sum, m goes from zero to infinity, the sum n goes from zero to infinity of a, m, n, what this means is I first fix a column and I add up in the column and then I vary my columns and I add up all the columns. What's the sum in the first column? Second column, third column, fourth column, nth column. So what's this whole sum going to be? Zero. Let's do it the other way. The sum n goes from zero to infinity. The sum m goes from zero to infinity of a, m, n. So now, what I'm doing is I'm fixing a row, and I sum over the row, and then I add up all the different row sums. What's the sum of the first row? Second row? Third row? All the other rows sum to zero. So what do I get if I sum in this order? One. These are not equal. Exercise. Right. Zero is not one. Order matters. Okay? This is absolutely surprising. What is going on here? Well, what's really going on here is I have an infinite region. Whenever you have infinities in mathematics, you have to be careful. So the danger is we have an infinite region. And the real issue is that the double sum, m goes from 0 to infinity, n goes from 0 to infinity of a, m, n is plus infinity. So you know, in a real analysis course, they would go into greater detail. I want you to be aware that there are dangers when you do integration. You can't always switch the orders of integrals. If your region is finite, if your function is continuous, this is Fubini's theorem. We'll talk more about this later in the semester. But right now, I just want you to be aware that you have to justify switching the orders. If you're integrating over finite rectangles of nice functions, there's no problem. OK, any questions on integration up till now? OK, what I want to do now is I want to finish chapter 12 in reverse order. So section 12.10, I want you to know it exists. Any questions? That's the level in which you need to know about section 12.10 for this course. Okay. There are generalizations of the second derivative test from Calc 1 and 2 to tell you if you have a maximum or minimum in several variables. I don't want to cover these. What class would make those, that section more enjoyable? Linear algebra. So when you have linear algebra, you can really interpret what's going on. When we get to Taylor series, I might say a few words about that. But essentially what's going on is we have a way to generalize these you know, tests from Calc 1, Calc 2. And the conditions are horrible if you don't know linear algebra. It's this times this minus this squared. If that's greater than 0 and this is greater than 0, then this is a minimum. You know, it's, it's horrible. When you know linear algebra, this is a nice way to rephrase it all and do it a unified approach. So I urge you to revisit this after taking linear algebra. If you're really interested, I'm happy to talk to you privately about this. But you know, for the most part, all I want you to know is section 1210 exists. There is a generalization of the second derivative test. All right, section 12.9 is a little bit more interesting. So this is Lagrange with multiple constraints. OK. So before, we had something like find the max or the minimum of some function f of x1 through xn subject to uh, say g1 of x1 through xn is c1. And I'm using slightly different notation than we did before because I think you can see what's coming. 
So before we had one constraint, g of x had to equal c. Now what do you think we're going to have? We're going to have Yeah, now I'll we'll have g2 of x1 through xn is c2. And of course, I could add even more constraints. I don't have to just limit myself to two constraints. And the question becomes, how do we generalize Lagrange multipliers to this situation? If you're taking a course in economics, you might need to have multiple constraints. If you want, imagine a giant football coming through a giant basketball, and you have the region of intersection of those two shapes and you have to be on both the surface of the basketball and the surface of the football. So if I had just this constraint, what does Lagrange multipliers tell me? If I have just that constraint. Good. So I've had the gradient of f is in the same direction as the gradient of g1. Normally, I would write as lambda times gradient g1. What am I going to write now? So instead of calling it lambda, what should I call it? So it's almost going to be the same as lambda, but what should I add to lambda? One, right? I have, this is my first constraint. Let's call that lambda one. The second one is going to give me the gradient of f is some multiple of the gradient of g2. And if both, if I have both, it implies the gradient of f is lambda 1 gradient of g1 plus lambda 2 gradient of g2. Okay? Let's think for a moment as to why this might be true. If we have just g1 of x1 through xn is c1, we have n minus 1 tangent directions, and we have one normal direction. If we have g2 of x1 through xn is c2, we have another n minus 1 tangent directions, and we have one normal direction. So I just want to give you a rough sense as to why this is true. If I only had this constraint, then to be at a maximum or minimum, I had to be perpendicular to every tangent direction. Well, the only direction that was left was the normal. But life is now different. I no longer have to be perpendicular to every tangent direction. And the reason is, it's not enough for g1 to equal c. I also need g2 to equal c2. So some of these tangent directions may take me off the intersection. And so before, I had to be in the direction of the normal, because I had to stay in the level set you know, g1 equals c1. I still have to stay in that level set, but now I can't move in every single direction. I lose one direction from this. Okay, So I can be in the direction of the normal, or I could also have some component in the direction that's normal to this, because that would not be an allowable way to move. And that's where you get this combination coming from. Okay? So I'm not going to go into more detail than this. Uh, basically, this is how you would do Lagrange multiplies with several variables. How much, calculus, how much has the calculus changed in going from one constraint to two constraints? Not much. This course, uh, sadly, is not about calculus most of the time. It's about algebra. How much has the algebra changed? So now we have one extra variable. We now have lambda 2. We still have the variables x1 through xn. We still have, so this will give us n constraints here. We'll have another constraint from here. I'm sorry, this gives us n constraints. Then we get one constraint from here, one constraint from here. We have n plus 2 constraints. We have n variables from our point, and then lambda 1, lambda 2. We have now n plus 2 unknowns. So we have n plus 2 equations and n plus 2 unknowns. We expect to be able to solve it. The algebra may be worse now because now we have one extra variable and we have more constraints to deal with. But the theory is essentially the same. OK. Any questions on Lagrange multipliers and several variables and several constraints? OK. 
So what I want to do now is we have, what, probably about 10 minutes left, 11 minutes left. So for the rest of the time, I'm going to just open it up to general questions on the course. So feel free to ask anything. If you are comfortable and you want to leave, you've got a busy day, by all means, you know, feel free to do so. Just whatever you guys want to ask is fine. All right, let me get an eraser. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Um, instead of instead of P S and R, can I do P Q and R? Okay. So here's my base point. Here's the origin. Here's P. Here's Q. And here's R. So I want to try to figure out what plane goes through all of them. So there's you know several ways to do this. Probably the easiest is you know I can find this direction. And I can find this direction. And so I'll call that V, I'll call that W. So V would be Q minus P, W would be R minus P. So this gives me two directions in the plane. This gives me my anchor point. If I want to calculate the normal, I need a vector that's perpendicular to V and perpendicular to W. The cross product will do that. So this is a nice consequence of living in a three-dimensional world. In a three-dimensional world, we have the cross product. Sadly, we do not have the cross product in general. But you know, in three dimensions, we do have the cross product. So that's probably the easiest way to find uh, the normal here. Will it be a unit normal? So does it have to be a unit vector? No. It's probably not going to be a unit vector. Does it matter? No, we're just looking for things that are perpendicular to the normal. If you're perpendicular to a vector, you're also perpendicular to twice that vector or thrice that vector. And so I don't need to find a unit vector here. So I can just do V cross W. I don't have to normalize it. If I wanted to make it a unit vector, what would I do? So how could I get a unit vector from this? I want it to be in the same direction, but I want it to have unit length. Good, yeah. So I would just divide v cross w, which is a vector, by the length of v cross w, which is a number. And that would give me a unit vector in the direction of v cross w. OK. Other questions? Yes. Um, so on, on, on this way, I just got that. Okay. Um, you said I would be the axis distribution when you're um, like the for the chain rule. Yeah. Right. So, so the instructions for the problem just said calculate the derivative two different ways. One way by using the chain rule. One way by substituting it directly. So, yeah. So if I give you maybe a this way, um, f of x y is maybe x squared plus y squared to the fourth plus x squared plus y squared. And maybe x is cosine theta and y is sine theta. I can look at the function a of theta is f of x of theta, y of theta. And if I wanted to calculate you know, dA d theta, that would be you know, df dx dx d theta plus df dy dy d theta. But I could also just evaluate it directly. What does this function equal? It just equals 2. Because cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. 1 to the fourth power is still 1. Cosine squared plus sine squared is, again, still 1. This function is just 2. So which would you prefer to differentiate? This and use the chain rule or the function 2? 
I would much prefer to differentiate the function too. So you know, why do we do the chain rule? Well, there will be times when it's easy to calculate the derivative of each piece and then combine them. This is a common theme, a very important idea in mathematics, is you take a complicated problem and you break it up into two simpler problems. Why do you think you get homework problems where you have something like this equals 2? It's not a coincidence, right? This is so you can quickly check your answer from the long, painful calculation, right? That's why a lot of times you have these very cherry-picked problems where when you do the direct substitution, you get an extremely nice function. It's to allow you to check and see, did you do the chain rule correctly? Also, from a theoretical perspective, the chain rule is essential for what we're doing. You know, we needed it for a lot of stuff on level sets and Lagrange multiplies and directional derivatives and all of these various things. We needed the chain rule to be able to have you know, the gradient of g at a point dotted with c prime of t. And so we do need the chain rule for some of the other stuff. But from a computational perspective, it's often easier to just you know, direct substitute. Other questions? Probably have time for two or three more. Yes? Sure. So the squeeze theorem uh, basically says the following. So you have two sequences, you know, say a n less than or equal to, we'll say three sequences, less than or equal to c n. And let's say a n goes to l and c n goes to l. Then basically, you know, b n is squeezed down to go to l2. And the way you can view this is, well, look, bn is always greater than or equal to an. So if the limit, this is the squeeze theorem. If the limit as n goes to infinity of an equals l, and bn is always greater than or equal to an, then the limit as n goes to infinity of bn has to be greater than or equal to l. It has no other possibility. Because it's always greater than each, each term bn is always greater than an. If an goes to l, then the bn's can't be going to anything below l. Similarly, we know the limit as n goes to infinity of cn equals l. We know bn is less than or equal to cn. Therefore, the limit as n goes to infinity of bn has to be less than or equal to l. So now we're playing the following game. I'm thinking of a number between L and L. Can you guess it? Okay, That's essentially the content of the squeeze theorem. I'm thinking of a number between L and L. And I'm an honorable person. I will think of a number between L and L. Okay. Other questions? Yes? E2 or E3? E2 or E3. E2 or E3. E1 sucks. Okay? E1 is horrible. It takes positive and negative errors, and it allows positive errors and negative errors to cancel each other out. So E1 gives you this ridiculousness that the best fit line between these three points is this. Okay? Depending on the metric you use, you can get different answers for problems. Okay? So for the most part in mathematics, there's a right answer. This is one of the few exceptions. Depending on how you choose to measure your error, you can get different best fit lines or best fit curves or best fit parameters. So I'm supposed to be uh, accommodating. I'm supposed to love diversity and all that and respect all the different opinions. But this is a place where I can say no. This, I can say, is just flat out wrong. As a math professor, I don't have to worry about making a statement like this. This is a bad way to measure errors. I can impose my values on you. Okay? I can't do that for E2 versus E3. So E2 and E3, E2 uses absolute values. Calculus is no longer applicable. That just means I have to work harder. E3, calculus is available, and I can get beautiful closed-form expressions. Personally, I like E2 more than E3. 
but I would never use E2 professionally because E2 is much harder to work with. So I agree that the absolute value is a better way to measure the errors. It treats everything equally. One bad data point doesn't have this undue consequence of shifting everything greatly. But it's a nightmare to use computationally. And so from computational reasons, E3 is preferable. But both E2 and E3 are valid choices. E1, I will say, is not valid. No one will accept E1 as a legitimate way of measuring errors. Does that answer the? Yeah. OK. We have time probably for one more, or, or at least half a question. Yes? Uh, we're not, we're not going to do really implicit functions in this class. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll talk to you privately about that. But um, for us, all we want for directional derivatives is I give you some vector, I give you some function, and I give you a point. And so basically, there's a lot of things in the book that I'm not covering. If I haven't covered it in class, I won't be putting it on the exams. You know, everything on the exams is going to come from things we've done in class. So the directional derivative is a quantity like this. And it has a vector, you know, v for our direction, which is hopefully a unit vector. It has a point where everything is based. And then it has some function which we have to differentiate. And we've talked a lot about you know, why the directional derivative is so useful. If we're trying to figure out maximum and minima, uh, bless you, the directional derivative is a number. So whenever you see any quantity in this class, please ask yourself, what kind of beast is this? Is it a number? Is it a vector? Is it a matrix? What kind of object is it? Directional derivatives are numbers. They tell you how fast is the function changing in a given direction. If you go through and take the special case where v is e1, which is just you know, something in the x1 direction, then you get the directional derivative of f after you do all the algebra, time is running out, is just df dx1 at the point. So the directional derivatives just become the partial derivatives in this special case. And this is one of the you know, nice ways to see how everything connects. So the directional derivatives, if you choose the vectors appropriately, they reduce to the standard partial derivatives. And this tells us that if we know the partial derivatives, we can calculate the derivative in any direction. OK, I will be in my office probably till about 3.40 when I have, is the camera still on? Yeah. Okay, is it off now? <laughs>